This is Edward Downs, quiz master for Texaco's Opera Quiz. With me this afternoon are four opera lovers and professional experts. Kurt Adler, as you all know, is chorus master and a conductor of the Metropolitan Opera. Terry McEwen, manager of the classical division of London Records. And our old friend, Sigmund Spaeth, the editor of the magazine Music Journal and author of over 30 books on music. As you know, he was a member of the very first quiz panel back in 1940. And William Weibel, an assistant conductor of the Metropolitan Opera, who is making his quiz debut with us this afternoon, and so we have an especially warm welcome for him. It's a Thank pleasure you. to have all of you with us, gentlemen. And here's our first question from Arno B. <coughs> Davidson of Sunland, California. Mr. Davidson writes, recently, while participati participating in a discussion on opera in America, one musicologist said, by bringing the Metropolitan Opera Company to the vast radio audience, Texaco has done more to enhance the cause of opera in America than any other music-minded organization. And the double-barreled question is this, is this above statement based on facts? And if it is, can you give us some concrete facts to support the musicologist's claim? Mr. McEwen. Mr. Downs, this is the question I've been waiting for since 1942, when I first started listening to these broadcasts. And as a matter of fact, I'm particularly honored to be sitting beside Dr. Spaeth today, who, in 1942, when I was listening to the broadcasts, was on the quiz panel, and I'm honored to be here with him. <laughs> I can't say how much Texaco has done for opera in America. My, uh, as far as concrete facts are concerned, I'm concrete enough. I wouldn't be here if it weren't for Texaco. When I did my homework as a child, I listened to the opera broadcasts more or less by chance and became an opera fanatic and it started me in the on a musical career I'd be a lawyer today if it weren't for the Met broadcasts and I know in my own generation uh, opera directors stage directors conductors singers I couldn't begin to name you how many have been inspired by these Texaco opera broadcasts I think that Texaco has changed the face of America by virtue of these broadcasts they've not only given a great appreciation of opera and aroused interest in opera throughout the country, but they've aroused an interest in music, in other forms of music as well as a branch. And I know that as far as concrete facts are concerned, we wouldn't be in the record business selling long-playing records of operas today in America if it weren't for these broadcasts. Yes. They're the greatest thing that ever happened as far as I'm concerned. Well, you know you're saying that reminds me of what Mr. Lieberman said in the first intermission. You know that he said 650 American singers in Germany alone, they certainly right. wouldn't be there either. If Every it were one not of those, for the I'm sure, of these started things. out from the brothel. Uh, right. Dr. Spaeth. Well, I agree thoroughly with Mr. McEwen. I used to lecture on music quite a lot before these broadcasts started, and frankly, I had to talk differently to audiences then, particularly about opera, from, from what I did later on. Uh, aside from the fact that these broadcasts have reached millions of people, literally, uh, they have created and stimulated an interest in opera which has taken very concrete and practical form in all these workshops that we hear about now. The colleges had no opera workshops before that. There are 700 and some today, I believe. So that the activity in opera in our smaller communities, I think, is directly due to these broadcasts, quite apart from the fact that so many people have become opera lovers who could not be in any way participants or performers. I was rather interested to have a call from a lady in North Carolina the other day asking me on what station she could get these broadcasts. That interested me because that's quite a long way off. Very, yes. Mr. Weibel? Well, I can uh, only more or less reflect uh, what Mr. McCune has just reiterated because my story is more or less the same. I wouldn't be a con an assistant conductor at the Met today if it wasn't for Texaco and the Metropolitan Broadcasts. I can remember coming home from the movies one, after one Saturday afternoon and putting on the radio, for the lack of nothing else to do, as children do, and the performance of Tannhäuser was on, and it was the last act, and I can remember hearing that Pilgrim's Chorus, and from then on I was hooked. I, <laughs> I never Marvelous. missed a broadcast from then on, and I, uh, thanks to my, also my mother's interest in helping me, <laughs> I had really been on the way. That's fascinating. And Dr. Adler. Bill, I think Venus must, must have done it to you. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would like to tell you about a recent experience driving in California. Uh, I had to go into a Texaco gas station, and the attendant there, who was very opera-minded, had listened to a performance of The Girl of the Golden West. And he was asking me, tell me, uh, in the forest there, 
Do you have a Texaco gas pump on the stage? Yeah. <laughs> 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 you liked operatic realism, <laughs> Mr. McEwen. Well, I'd just like to say that what got me, I remember as a child, my father saying to me, why do you enjoy those broadcasts so much? What, what is there in this opera bit? And I used to say, well, there, it sort of goes on, and every once in a while there's a nice tune and everyone applauds. Uh -huh. And after I'd been listening to four or five broadcasts, there was a Pons Lucia broadcast. And I remember at the end of the mad scene, Milton Cross, very excited uh, by the performance, saying, listen to that little lady sing. And I thought, well, if he can get excited, there must be something about this. <laughs> I might add just one brief detail. I happen to know that in many communities, there are groups who meet regularly on Saturday afternoons simply to listen to these broadcasts. I think that's also a good sign yes, of the I've, I've, influence. I know of the same thing. I, it's really incredible what it's done. But here we have a very different kind of question. This is from an opera lover with a critical ear, William Pashong of Evanston, Illinois. And he writes, sometimes in a perfectly serious situation, an operatic character says something or asks a question so foolish that the whole audience would probably break up if the music and mood of the scene weren't so powerful that you forget such petty details. For instance, in the final scene of Donizetti's Lucia de Lammermoor, the hero, Edgardo, goes to the family tomb of the Ravenwoods to end his sorrow with his life by allowing himself to be stabbed to death in a duel with his mortal enemy. And while he's waiting for this uh, lugubrious conclusion, a chorus of mourners informs him that his beloved Lucia is dying. And finally, Lucia's tutor, Raimondo, enters with the news, and I quote, Lucia no longer is on this earth. And Edgar, who isn't very quick on the uptake, answers, <laughs> no longer on this earth? Where is she then? <laughs> <laughs> now, Mr. Pashong thinks that there must be other equally incredible remarks in opera, and he wants to know if you have some favorites, gentlemen. Dr. Spade. I think my favorite occurs in the last act of Siegfried, when Siegfried discovers Brunhilde asleep there on the mountain, and he has just cut off her coat of, coat of mail, and then springs back, in fact, usually leaps halfway across the stage and says, das ist kein Mann, that is no man. The audience always titters when that yes, line comes out. It's quite obvious from the lady's <laughs> figure, mostly. <laughs> well, nowadays, they try to avoid the laughter by kind of saying, das ist kein Mann. You don't quite understand the word. <laughs> Mr. Weibel. Well, I think uh, one moment that always arouses uh, humor in my mind comes in the fourth act of Pelias and Melisson, which you heard this year on Texaco broadcast. Um, in the fourth act, when Golo is yanking Melisson back and forth across the stage by her tresses, by her hair, and Melisson very astutely remarks, Je ne suis pas heureux, which in English means, I'm not happy. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Adler. Uh, to me, the shortest and silliest question and answer occurs in the fourth act of Carmen. Now, Carmen just had been warned that Don Jose is, is lurking somewhere and waiting for her. And the moment she, he appears and she sees him, she says, C'est toi? Is it you? And he says, C'est moi. It's me. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. McEwen. Well, mine, I, I think that the, one of the important things about this thing is that it depends very much on the singer, whether the line gets a laugh or not. Yes. Uh, in Sonambula, for instance, in the second act, um, Amina, after all, the opera is called the Sonambulist, the sleepwalker, and she sleepwalks into the Count's bedroom in his little hotel. And uh, sleepwalks, very obviously sleepwalks across the room, and the Count looks at her for a full three minutes and then turns to the audience and says, Dorme. She's sleeping, and which generally, generally gets a laugh. But if he sings it straight, it shouldn't get a laugh, actually. Yes, of course. And uh, he, he shouldn't disturb the mood. If he sings it straight, it doesn't. But if he hams it up, which basses very often do, it gets a laugh. No, I should not it depends it on the singer yes, very much, though. I think. That could really break up the mood. Uh, there is a kind of operatic rejection that we often meet with, which, is, which we might call a denunciation in very dramatic situations. And this one is concerned with denunciations by the entire chorus against a single character. Oren Safier of San Francisco, California, sent in the question, and he wants you to name four operatic characters who are denounced or reviled by the chorus and explain why they are. Describe the general situation to us. Mr. Weibel. 
Well, the first one that comes to my mind, and probably the greatest one for me, comes in Simon Bocanegra, when Paolo is denounced by the chorus, um, and they cry out, Sia maledetto, which in English means um, you are cursed. And this happens because Paolo is, is discovered as being the very one who has plotted against Simon Bocanegra, while at the same moment he had pretended to be his greatest friend. And when this is brought out by Bocanegra himself and the chorus discovers the popolo in, in a word, uh, discover what has happened, they cry out and they are summoned by Bocanegra to curse him. And everybody cries out, Sia maledetto. And Dr. Adler? A real tragic rejection appears in Rigoletto when the chorus takes the side of the duke against uh, Rigoletto, the father who really had gone through a terrible experience.